muted. Unmuted. Thank you for joining us today for the V-Ray webinar series part one, V-Ray for Revit. Um, we're going to get started right now. I'm just going to go through a quick introduction and then we're going to pass the mic over to Brian Russell. Um, he's our V-Ray product manager and has a lot of technical experience and will be giving us a great overview on V-Ray for Revit. Um, feel free to ask any questions in the GoToWebinar um, dashboard. Uh, there is a little question there. Um, have we started? Yes, we have. So quick overview about who SolidCAD is. Again, we are here located in Toronto, but um, we're actually under the Cancel uh, family, so we do have Cancel offices all across Canada. Um, if you don't know, we actually, being part of under Cancel, have uh, access to different uh, product lines, including plotters and uh, paper supplies, as well as we do laser scanning equipment and surveying equipment as well. Um, if you're not familiar with SolidCAD, we are an Autodesk uh, training center as well. Uh, so if you do have any inquiries on uh, training and services, whether it be uh, basic training, advanced training, um, setup and customizations, you know, get in touch with, with us. We're happy to help you. Um, you know, we've been around for quite some time, uh, 29 years uh, as an Autodesk partner, um, as being part under the Cancel umbrella. We now have even a bigger application specialist team in Canada and Ontario alone. Um, we do specialize in different product lines, including the Chaos Group and Autodesk and Bluebeam, and provide training and technical support on those solutions. Uh, we also provide technical services, including consulting and programming and hardware support as well as required. If you don't know too much about our BIM services, we do quite a bit uh, on the BIM side. Um, everything from basic software deployment and license management, training, project-based mentoring, which has now become a very big topic, um, development of standards and templates, and really optimizing your BIM software and, so, and technology to be really productive with it. Um, content creation and management, um, we're able to use our technical resources to develop this in-house. Uh, if you do have any specific manufacturing data or specific data for your architectural or uh, project clients that um, need it to be spec'd into the project. Um, as well as we do model authoring, uh, VR 
and construction sequencing within Navisworks. And we also do Osbuilt uh, laser scanning uh, to create point clouds and very accurate level of detail within the Revit model or AutoCAD drawings. Um, just like with all our software and services, we provide full technical support. If you're not familiar with our tech support team, um, definitely get in touch with them. Um, right here, you've got our phone number as simple as 187-438-2231, which spells get CAD1 and extension 2, and you get our tech support team. You can also send an email at support at solidcad.ca if you have any issues with any of your software that we have uh, sold to you. Um, if you're a uh, SolidCAD customer or client of ours, um, the one thing you probably don't know is that you actually have a technical workflow process assessment uh, free of charge. You know, get in touch with your account manager. We're happy to work with you and understand your business issues and really um, nail down a workflow that will make sense to your company. Um, some of the people on our tech support team, um, you, you know, if you're calling our support, um, you'll probably get uh, either Chris or Kathy, but we also have some really great talent on our architectural engineering side, including Peter Shu, Patrick Semak, and Jay Polding. And they're very, very well versed in both the architectural and engineering solutions. So, um, you know, you're probably working with them quite regularly uh, if you've been, uh, yeah, got in touch with us lately. Um, the one thing I can also mention, uh, there is an available Canada Ontario job grant. So if you're not on Revit yet, or you've got some guys on Revit who need a little bit more training or to get to that next level, whether it be a BIM manager training or project consulting, um, there is an opportunity to you know, use the Canada Ontario job grant to subsidize a good majority of the training and support fees with solid CAD. Um, if you're a small company of under 25, um, you are eligible up to 83%, okay? Um, at the end of the presentation, we're going to email it, you some information. Um, there is an available V-Ray for Revit um, trial that you can make a request on our e-store. And if you want to purchase a V-Ray for Revit immediately, um, there's a promo special that you can go directly to our e-store at e-store.solidcad.ca. And uh, you can purchase V-Ray for Revit and get a 10% discount by inputting V-Ray Revit 10 um, until January 31st, 2017. So right now I'm going to pass over the information, uh, the mic over to Brian, and he's going to get started with the V-Ray for Revit. All right, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, if you don't mind, um, let me see if I can grab a presenter here and show my screen. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, uh, my name is Brian Russell. I'm the business line manager for V-Ray for Revit. I've got uh, over 20 years in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Uh, several of those um, as a former BIM manager and Revit implementation specialist, uh, as well as a visualization specialist. Um, uh, my email address is there. In case you have any comments or questions for me, it's brian.russell at chaosgroup.com. I'm always happy to hear your feedback uh, in regard to the product. So just a brief agenda here. Um, uh, Muted. What to do is uh, a quick product overview, uh, some simplified uh, UI, uh, show you what we've done with the user interface, uh, talk a bit about camera effects that are built into V-Ray for Revit, um, I'm going to touch on uh, a little more extensively uh, um, Swarm, which is our new distributed rendering model uh, that ships with V-Ray for Revit. It's a pretty cool um, little config uh, distributed rendering engine. And uh, finally, I'll touch on the standalone VR mat editor. And along the way, I'll, I'll throw out some tips and tricks for V-Ray for Revit and generating uh, really nice imagery from directly inside of Revit without having to leave the interface. Uh, in starting V-Ray for Revit uh, a couple of years ago, um, uh, we sat down and interviewed hundreds of architecture, engineering, construction firms all over the globe, um, and in fact some of our top artists, and said, look, we're interested in making a product for specifically for the architecture space and more specifically for a BIM tool. And, um, and, and we got some feedback pretty immediately that um, whatever we make, had to be accessible by designers. In other words, designers have to be able to pick the product up and use it um, as easily as possible. 
we needed to simplify the interaction. In other words, um, we didn't want to have to send people to school to learn how to use a renderer. They need to be able to actually open it up, click a couple of buttons, and get to, to a rendering fairly quickly. Um, good results and fast, of course, go hand in hand with that. And, and so uh, using that as our driving uh, force behind development of the product, we looked at um, a lot of the imagery and types of imagery that we were seeing from designers versus, let's say, architectural visualization specialists, um, which we've kind of worked with traditionally all along with V-Ray. And this is basically the level of what we were seeing for most of the designers. Um, they're doing these, uh, we'll call it a model in white rendering, um, because they're studying form, they're studying light, um, they're understanding scale, how light bounces around inside of the space. And so uh, the need for photo reel uh, right away in early design process is less. Um, in later design processes, it's much more. Uh, but for most designers, they, they need to do quick studies so that they can make design decisions. Um, here's an example of, of another type of model in white. This one happens to be using a subsurface scattering material override. This is from V-Ray for Revit specifically, and it's made to look like a 3D print. Uh, this is the other style of rendering that we would see. Um, and this is uh, a rendering that was set up so that you can make it look like a 3D printed starch model. You could take your physical starch model with you to a client um, uh, interview or a client meeting and then have a series of renderings that looked very much um, like the actual physical 3D model that helps tell a consistent story. So again, design focus here, um, more about uh, showcasing the building. And so really we needed to take the V-Ray renderer and make it available and easy to use by the designer. So uh, uh, where does that leave us and where does that leave the designer versus the visualization expert conversation? Well, here's the visualization experts kind of uh, side of things. Again, uh, rendered in V-Ray for Revit. Um, You'll notice some post-production in there. We've got some snow falling in the foreground. The lighting is tweaked uh, to be dramatic. The camera setup has been tweaked a little bit so it looks right. Uh, the snow has a bit of displacement on the ground. Very creative imagery that tells a very different story using the exact same model that you saw um, uh, that our designers might use. So this is what we would use um, to really sell the product, our project, um, to the board to get approvals, things of that nature. But the designer's job versus the ArcViz job are two very different jobs. I don't think either are going away. What we're trying to do is enable workflows between the two that really make um, sense for both the visualization expert as well as the non-visualization expert alike. If you look at V-Ray for Revit under the hood, and you look at uh, V-Ray, in fact, uh, under the hood, you see that uh, there are uh, quite literally thousands of different settings. And in fact, what you're looking at is a spreadsheet that we use to help us set up some of those settings um, in V-Ray for Revit. So minimum subdivisions, maximum subdivisions, uh, DMC sampler thresholds, et cetera, right? Designers don't care about this stuff. They want to hit a button and get a result. Uh, visualizations experts, they understand what every single one of these things are, how they affect the overall rendering time, quality, things of that nature and it becomes very important to them. So what we've done uh, to that end is taken all of this data, met with our top artists, met with our top um, uh, AEC customers all over the world, and said, tell us the best settings. We've compiled that data. Uh, we've set that data. We continue to kind of tweak it as we go along. Uh, but now it's, it's a really simple interface. It's draft unmuted and very high. And, if you're a Revit user, this is going to be a very familiar uh, interface to you. Hey, Brian, can I ask you for a small yeah. favor? Can you just uh, hide your GoTo meeting panel? Ah, sure, absolutely. Let me see. There, that arrow. Ah, perfect. Okay. All right. Thank is that you. That a little better. Yep, that's good. Awesome. So. Uh, moving into the camera, what we what we really wanted to do with the camera is use again non-destructive to the to the BIM became kind of our mantra all along. We want to make sure that we're not destroying your actual work, which is documenting documenting um, uh, the project. 
but rather augmented that and allowed you to get quick visualization out that actually made sense. So uh, to that end, uh, we're using the native cameras that ship with um, uh, with Revit. Um, in other words, you go in and you create a camera just as you always would in Revit. Um, what I'm showing you here is uh, is something like exposure value settings. We've got them on a slider, very easy to use. You can slide them up and down. And in fact, I'm showing you uh, V-Ray RT as the engine that's, that's running uh, behind the scenes so that you can see this update. And I'm doing this off my laptop uh, for this bit of the presentation. So uh, it's a bit slower than you might get on your desktop, but you get the idea. Uh, same with white balance. Again, we've got a slider where you can type in values. Uh, so if you want it to be a little more blue, a little more orange, uh, whatever the case may be, um, easy to use, easy to see updates if you're doing RT. Um, if you're doing production, you can kind of tweak these values and hit render and understand where things are. Along those same lines, we didn't want to take all of the cool tools away. And so um, we wanted to give you a little bit of uh, ability to be creative and set yourself apart. Uh, so we've included depth of field effects. Um, in cameras as well. Uh, again, just a, an example of that, you can set your defocus amount. You set your focus distance, that is where your camera target would be, um, uh, give or take, uh, and, uh, and you get an update. And you're going to see that kind of progress as we go along here. So I need to change my focal distance so it's a little bit closer. Um, and then I start to get a depth of field effect. Things that are further away get blurry. Things that are within the focal distance become clear. Um, also, we have optical vignetting there, which gives you kind of a, a camera, a physical camera effect. And so, again, we've tried to add these things on the sliders, make them easy to use, um, so that they don't become really complex things, but they become things that are actually usable by designers in production. In addition to that, one of the things that's come up time and again is scale. Um, and you talk to any architectural designer for any uh, length of time and they'll tell you one of the biggest challenges that they have is representing scale to a customer. Um, it's one thing to draw it in 2D, it's another to model it in 3D and show them on a screen. Uh, it's quite a different experience though if you're able to quickly generate uh, virtual reality imagery that you can drop into Google Cardboard or Samsung Gear or even the Oculus device. Um, and to that end, what we've done in V-Ray for Revit is actually included a camera type uh, that will take whatever your camera is uh, in Revit and generate either a 6 to 1 or 12 to 1 image, a square image, cubic image, um, that can drop into any of those devices uh, fairly quickly and fairly easily so that you can do uh, quick even design studies. So the interesting part here is that designers can suddenly do something that they've never been able to do before. Um, they can do a model in white rendering. They can check scale. And I've got a, I've got a story from my days as a BIM manager where um, uh, the architecture practice that I worked for um, had to verify scale on a column. And this column was, was like three meters tall. Um, and so what they wanted to do with this, um, with this column was be able to kind of see what that felt like in the space. What, what is three meters feel like inside of the space. And so they actually drew this thing out on a very long piece of paper. They, they pulled some of the printer paper out of the, uh, out of the plotter, uh, rolled up you know, three meters of paper and drew in uh, the column to scale. And then they dropped it from the upper mezzanine of the office down uh, below and held it up high so they can kind of see what it felt like. Um, a very arduous process just to verify scale and kind of show scale. Uh, not very friendly. Um, here's a case where we could have done that exact same thing using the Revit model. We already have it. The, the column's already in there. We render it as a VR image. Uh, we pull it into a Gear VR or a, or a cardboard device. We hold it up. We look around and we can see exactly what that scale feels like at human level. Um, and so VR has become a very important part of our vocabulary um, uh, and part of the design process and a, and a nice, friendly, easy way to show um, scale and light and form to your clients. And so to that end, uh, the Cubic VR camera inside of, of Revit, and I'll show it, I'll demonstrate this here in just a mo moment, is uh, actually just a single click and very, very easy to use. 
uh, V-Ray Swarm. Um, we listen to a lot of our customers talk about um, distributed rendering and you know medium to large size firms let's say um, let's say anywhere from 50 people on up um, typically have uh, some type of, of rendering capability built in-house um, but we wanted to make that accessible to say a five-person firm or even a two-person firm that had a handful of computers available to them and so um, while we're continuing our roadmap, we've got a cloud-based service that's that's on our roadmap in the in the long term. Hopefully, we'll start to see parts of that this year. But um, in the meantime, we we needed a kind of a zero or a low configuration distributed rendering that you can put in um, to your own office uh, that's easy to set up. You run an executable. It installs on, on your computers. You can use it on all of your production computers. And what's nice about Swarm, uh, which is the product that we've developed, uh, is that it's fully elastic. And I know that's a bit of a buzzword, but uh, what it means is this. Uh, let's say I've got five computers in my office, and I've got four employees. One of the computers is never used, and I've got Swarm installed on all five computers. The other four are used to varying degrees throughout the day. What Swarm is going to do is it's going to use the processes that those four users don't use. It'll use 100% of the processors, um, whether graphics, GPUs, graphics processors, or CPUs, uh, central processors, is irrelevant to Swarm. It'll use, uh, you can set it up so you're, you're using either GPU or CPU uh, for your nodes. So um, it looks at the uses on the end computer and automatically scales up or down based on how the computer is being used. So if I get up and go grab tea or go grab coffee, um, I'm not using my computer. Swarm's going to take more of my resources. When I come back to my computer and start to use it, Swarm's going to let those resources go so that I never really notice that Swarm's running in the background. It just is. Um, in the meantime, what it's allowing me to do is from any one of those nodes, I can actually manage the entire network of nodes. So every single one of the nodes that Swarm is installed on has a web-based interface at, at a port. In this case, 24267 is the default port, but you can customize that. And if you go to the computer name and the port name, you can actually go in here and see all of the other uh, Swarm nodes that are there and manage all of them or any one of them uh, directly from this web-based interface. The other nice thing about this is that uh, in the past, in the typical distributed rendering model, what would happen is you'd send a job out uh, to this distributed renderer, and you'd actually have to pull all of the assets along with it. So all of the geometry, all of the maps, materials, etc., would have to be bundled up and sent to every single render node individually. Swarm is built on a very different, um, in a very different way. It's actually using peer-to-peer. -peer. So what happens is um, you submit to any one of the nodes, and the rest of the nodes help each other distribute the packages between themselves. So it becomes much faster to send assets, and you no longer have a dreaded kind of black bucket where some, some processor didn't get all the resources that it needed. Um, Swarm is really intelligent in that way, and you don't end up having those issues. Um, you can add tags, so if you've got groups of computers uh, inside of your network that you want to use in very different ways, for instance, you want to set aside some for GPU processing uh, versus CPU processing, uh, you can do that and you have the ability. You can also set up your license servers and things of that nature inside of the Swarm configuration. Any one of the nodes at any point in time, you can bring up and look at their resource usage, CPU, GPU, memory, network, and storage space. And you can simply turn them on or off by checking enabled or disabled. So you can bring nodes online or take them offline as you see fit. So Swarm really is revolutionizing the way that we do distributed rendering today and should make distributed rendering available to people who aren't IT managers and don't know how to set up distributed rendering. It really is just an executable that you run and it becomes available to you inside of Reddit. And I'll show you how that works here in just a bit. In addition to that, we've got um, a new standalone material editor, and this actually uh, was born out of our beta process in V-Ray for Revit. We had a lot of people say, look, uh, we want to be able to make uh, V-Ray materials, 
Um, so by default, what we do in V-Ray for Revit is we take all of the materials that live inside of your Revit model, whether, whether they're um, mental ray or their Autodesk materials is irrelevant. We, at render time, we, we translate those into VR maps um, automatically for you. It's part of our Autogen process. But we do give you the ability to do either global overrides or individual overrides of those materials. And so uh, to do that, you can either create or edit your own VR maps. So if you've got a, a visualization specialist inside of your firm, they may already have a bunch of uh, V-Ray materials that they've set up. Um, grass is a good one. So for instance, V-Ray supports displacement for grass. That's something that doesn't ship with Autodesk. You don't get that with mental rain. You don't get that with the Autodesk um, material itself. So you can't set displacement in those, so we can't interpret it. Uh, but you do get that in VR mat. So we could create a grass material here that has displacement. We can drag and drop it right into this slot for grass, let's say, and it will populate there and automatically pull that at render time. So um, you do have the ability to do uh, individual overrides of all the materials in your scene, um, all the materials in your project. Uh, you can save those settings then and load them and, and send them with the file. Uh, so if people want to see them, they, they have access to them. But with a standalone material editor, you can also open any VR map. So whether it's created in 3D Studio Max or, or V-Ray for 3D Studio Max, V-Ray for, for Rhino or V-Ray for SketchUp, is irrelevant uh, because we can open it and edit it inside of the standalone material editor, save it and use it inside of Revit. So VR maps become useful across the product lines, whether you're using V-Ray for Max, V-Ray for Maya, SketchUp, Rhino, et cetera, doesn't really matter. Those VR maps are, are shared assets now, and you can create your own libraries that you, you have mappings that you can go back and forth on. We're continuing to develop this. Um, we've got some exciting things on the roadmap for materials that will allow us to do groups of materials very quickly and easily. Uh, so stay tuned, be on the lookout for that uh, in the near future. So this is the part of the demonstration where I go live, and I always preface this with a very sarcastic, what could possibly go wrong? Um, go to webinar, go to meeting, um, uh, and, uh, and Revit and V-Ray don't always get along very well, so um, bear with me. Hopefully we won't have any issues today. Um, uh, but if we do, we'll roll with it and, uh, and go from there. Hey Brian, I'm gonna. So this is. A, hey Brian, we have a quick question: Is V-Ray Swarm available for Max distributed uh, V-Ray rendering? Uh, not currently. It's uh, we're looking at it as part of the roadmap for Max. I don't have a timeline on that just yet, but we are looking at that to become available uh, for Max, and in fact, probably several of the other um, uh, V-Ray verticals in the near future. It will ship with uh, V-Ray for SketchUp and V-Ray for Rhino, which should be coming soon. Uh, the new 3.4 version of those is uh, currently in development and in beta, uh, and will be dropping relatively soon, hopefully within this quarter. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, so it will ship with those products, but uh, hopefully Max and Maya in the near future as well. Great. Thank you. No problem. So um, moving right into Revit, you should be able to see Revit on your screen now. And uh, what we've done here, just a few things in the interface I'd like to point out. And I'll try to speed it along just a bit because I know we're going to get tight on time. But um, uh, the way that the Revit API works prior to 2017.1 uh, is that if you're actually active in a camera view and you try to send a rendering from up here, you can't do it. Um, and, and a large part of that was because uh, Autodesk didn't make the Revit API available to us to actually see or, or gather information from. Uh, that has since changed, I'm happy to say, in 2017.1, Autodesk has made it uh, available to us to see. So now that we're here, we can actually see the view and send renderings while we're there. Uh, we've got a bit of work to do in that regard uh, in the near future so that we can uh, send renderings directly from the view, but for now, you can select any one of your camera views here. Uh, of course, you can also type in um, a, a keyword to find very quickly the view that you happen to be looking at. Um, over here, we've got the different renderer types. Uh, we've got our, our kind of traditional um, uh, V-Ray production renderer that, that you all know and love, um, V-Ray RT. Uh, 
Uh, frankly, there's there's almost no difference between RT and, and really no difference between RT and production V-Ray renderer in terms of output today. Uh, so that's exciting to know. Um, and one of the really great things about RT for designers is the ability to make um, changes to time of day, for instance, in Reddit and see that update live as they're in the process of rendering. So uh, in addition to that, we also allow you to export a VR scene. The VR scene file is going to include not only the geometry from your scene, but the lighting, the uh, material overrides, uh, and materials, uh, all of the things that make up your, your particular scene. Uh, once you have a VR scene, you can actually render that in, in V-Ray standalone. So if you've got V-Ray for Max and you've got V-Ray standalone that ships with that, um, you can pull a VR scene from Revit and render it in VR standalone uh, using the export VR scene option. Show hide frame buffer does just that. Uh, it allows us, if we're popped under, to pull the frame buffer to the front. Um, this is a rendering I did just a bit earlier uh, in draft mode. This is a draft level rendering. I'll come back to that here in just a moment. Uh, resolution, if you're familiar with Revit, should be a relatively familiar uh, dialogue to you because it's pretty much what rendering is inside of Revit natively. Uh, we've got some presets here. You have the ability to set custom um, and you can link aspect ratios or unlink them as you see fit. Uh, and then, of course, we use crop region and you can either do screen or printer and set DPI, um, uh, which will use the the crop region that's around your particular view or your camera uh, to render. Uh, here's those settings that we talked about earlier, draft low, medium high, and very high. And I'm going to expand on those here in just a little bit when I get to the settings. I'll show you some of, of what's there. Artificial lights, uh, interior lights um, specifically, or non-environment lights, I should say, specifically. Uh, we did a very interesting thing because um, we have the need to, again, be non-destructive to the BIM. That means we can't uh, go through all of the lighting fixtures that you have in your model and expect you to place V-Ray uh, lighting fixtures. And so what we've done is we've taken the lighting, whatever lighting families you happen to have uh, loaded, um, and we will either read the IES file that you've specified uh, for that fixture, or we'll uh, assign it as a generic IES file. So all your interior lights function as interior lights, and we'll pull the settings from the light um, and and have adjustments to overall strength of the light, um, color of the light, things of that nature get pulled across. So really, artificial lights is either on or it's off. The only benefit to having it off, if you're doing an external uh, daytime rendering, um, this is going to save you uh, quite a bit of time. If it's dawn or dusk, um, you want to show some interior lights, you're going to want to turn those guys on. Um, and it'll increase your render time just a bit, but uh, we'll be processing all of your interior lights. Um, V-Ray Sun, uh, what we've done for our implementation of V-Ray Sun is we simply use the mechanism that's built into Revit natively. So your, your daylight settings that are built into Revit, uh, under your camera views, for instance, you set time of day, you set latitude, longitude. Uh, we pull all that across and we simply replace the, the, the Revit sun that's in there with a V-Ray sun at render time. Uh, we do have some settings for the V-Ray sun. So you can do things like adjust your sun intensity and your sun size. And one quick little tip um, uh, to that regard is if you're, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're set up with a sun uh, you're an interior scene like a kitchen, like the kitchen that you see over here, uh, or the living room that you see over here. You're in an interior, you've got curtain wall or you've got storefront um, that's letting exterior light in, but you want to see your interior lights. Uh, bring your sun intensity down to like 0.01 um, or 0.05. And then what will happen is it will allow, uh, without having to blow out your exposure, it will allow you to see um, the exterior light coming from the outside as well as your interior lights will actually show up without having to set the, the uh, intensity on those way up beyond where it should be. So just a quick tip in that regard. If, uh, we basically are taking physical a physical camera, which would, if you're in an interior scene, actually make all of that blow out. It'd be over bright. Um, and we're faking it. Now we're making it do what a physical camera can. So. Um, that's one quick way that you can do that. 
of course, we've had people say, well, what about lighting with HDR? Um, and to that end, we've uh, developed a dome light. The dome light will override your sun settings and allow you to use HDR imagery um, to light your scene. So you can uh, pull in an HDR image, you can set rotation, and in fact, this is the sample that we ship with in the, in the product. Again, you can adjust overall intensity. So if you've got that scenario where it's midday um, and you want to show interior light showing, you can adjust intensity to, to get there. Um, so very quick, very easy to set up. Uh, lighting scenarios there. Uh, of course, you can do no light option. That's an option if you're trying to do troubleshooting uh, that we've included in there. <clears throat> Material browser. Uh, Material Browser is going to go through and collect all of your Revit uh, materials out of the database and you can actually look at all materials, your project materials or the current view materials. <clears throat> In addition to that, individual overrides uh, are available, but um, probably one of the most used features in V-Ray for Revit right now currently is the global, global material overrides and that's the ability to override all of your opaque materials with a specific V-Ray uh, material and all of your transparent materials with a specific V-Ray material and that's how you get to a model in white which is great for doing those quick studies. Uh, so I'll just turn those off for now but know that they're in there and they're, they're really easy to, to use. Of course if you've got VR match you can drag and drop them um, right over the top of where it says automatically generated here and it will replace that with your maps VR mat. So uh, that's what we've done on the material browser side and we continue to, to develop this as we go along. Exposure settings, you saw these a bit earlier in the video so I'm not going to dwell on them uh, too much as well as effects like um, defocus and optical vignetting. Uh, we, we have those effects built in here. Um, and then we've got our camera types. So we've got a standard camera, a stereoscopic camera, right left channel. Uh, VR camera, which is a cubic six to one. Um, cardboard users are probably somewhat familiar with that. And then a stereo um, cubic, which is going to give you a left channel six to one and a right channel six to one. And if you think of, um, for those that maybe aren't as familiar with VR, um, if you think of a cube <coughs> being unwrapped, that's basically what we're doing with this imagery. So if we wanted to do a quick uh, 12 to 1 rendering, let's say, um, uh, inside of V-Ray, we'd simply select this. And what it's going to do, if we go back to our resolution dialog, um, just to bring this up, is it's going to use whatever our height is set at. So in this case, my height is set at 648. And it's going to multiply that by 12 um, to get the individual frames, or multiply that by 6 if I'm just doing the, the VR camera itself. Um, and that's how we're going to get our resolution. So it's going to use the height. So if you want your height set at something specific, uh, by the way, the lower devices like Google Cardboard and um, and um, uh, the the um, Samsung Gear device, generally speaking, anything over over 800 for height is probably going to get lost in terms of overall resolution. Um, so just bear that in mind. Uh, certainly you can take it up to high def, but anything over 1K absolutely will be lost. And if you're going to go to one of the higher end devices like the HTC Vive, uh, those devices, uh, Oculus, um, those devices will support up to 2K, 4K, etc. Um, so you can go a little larger with those renderings. I'm just going to leave this as is for now, just to show you a quick, just how easy it is to, to make it happen. And I'm not going to do the full rendering here, but I do want you to to get an idea of what happens when I hit the render button. You'll notice that my aspect ratio has changed and my overall image, just to make this clear, has is, is suddenly become 600 by 7200 and that's that 600 times 12 is going to give me you know, 7200. So, so that's where we land with this and, it, and once this image is done I can again drag this over to my device um, and it's pretty much ready to go. I'll go ahead and stop that for now just so I can continue on with, uh, uh, with this because I'm getting a little tight on time. But um, Settings, this is where um, if, if you're a person that likes to kind of spin the knobs and tweak the, the settings a bit, this is where you can do that. Uh, here's where you can find material pads and supplement material pads if you're not finding materials. <clears throat> export settings, we do some procedural geometry tessellation on export. 
So you can see at draft, we're at 8, at very high, we're at 12. You can tweak these settings as you see fit. Um, render channels, if you like to composite in Photoshop um, or similar program after the fact, you can actually set up uh, individual channels and they'll show up in the frame buffer and you can export those as images. Uh, we also support the denoiser um, that's built in the latest Max 3.4. Uh, this is a quick way if you've got a low light, very noisy image, it's a quick way to clean up the noise in, in uh, the image um, without having to set the render settings to something ridiculous. Um, so if you haven't played with the denoiser, check out um, docs.chaosgroup.com and take a look at the denoiser inside of docs. Um, it's really, really powerful. Uh, it also uh, has the ability to be GPU accelerated, so if you've got a high-end GPU, we'll, we'll support that. Um, Z-depth channel, etc. of course, we support in there. We give you the ability to save your settings and export them so that others can pull them in and use them. Um, it's really just an XML file, so it's fairly simple and easy to use. You can set material environment and camera settings. It'll pull those things across and you can import selective settings as well. So if you only want materials, certain materials, um, you can check those for import and ignore everything else. So really powerful ability to give you um, uh, the, the opportunity to kind of swap your settings back and forth or have someone that's knowledgeable set the settings for you and share them out with all the rest of your designers. RT settings, CPU, GPU, these get a bit more complex. Uh, I'm not going to take a deep dive into this today. Just know that it's there if you want to use it. Um, uh, for my specialists, you may have settings that you're familiar with that you want to use here, and those are available to you. <clears throat> for the overall engine, these are our uh, settings for, for engine. So you have the ability to change between brute force, irradiance map, light cache, etc and change your image sampler between buckets and progressive. If you're doing a, a large distributed rendering, maybe you'll want to run buckets, and you want to set this at like uh, 28 uh, or 24 for bucket size, if you've got several machines, and that will actually speed up your rendering a bit. If you set your bucket size, I will, I will say that with, with some caveat here, if you uh, make your bucket size too small, it'll actually slow your renders down, so um, Best to keep it kind of maybe between 24 and 32, which is the default. Uh, those are really good settings that we've uh, had a lot of really good luck with. Um, and again, typically we're only using buckets when we want to speed up a rendering that we're doing in a distributed fashion, like through Swarm. Um, the progressive is much faster and gives you better results um, in, in the long run. We do support the infinite ground plane inside of V-Ray for Revit, so if you don't want to go in and generate uh, topography, you can use infinite ground plane here. Just check to enable it. Set the height, either positive or negative values are supported here. Um, choose your material source, um, and you're good to go. Uh, probabilistic lights, uh, this calculates a percentage of your lights, which actually speeds up the process. It will look for different lights, but it, it's only calculating a percentage it's almost like instancing your lights for you to some degree. Um, and we've got some exciting new features coming to, to lights in the future, so stay tuned in that regard. Hopefully within a year you'll start to see uh, even more powerful things that we can do with lights here. Uh, and V-Ray section box. Uh, what we do with the section box is we support Revit's native section box, and then uh, we allow you to kind of uh, clip beyond that. So uh, we do have aerial perspective in here and environment fog, and I'll, I'll uh, kick back over here in just a moment. But uh, the last thing I want to point out in the live demo portion here is that in order to use form, really all we have to do is enable it and dial up the total number of network resources we want to use, or total percentage of network resources we want to use. So what this is going to do is force communication amongst your team over who has rights to do, you know, all the resources, um, but it, you can break it out by percentage and it's first come, first served um, for network resources. So if someone needs priority, you simply scale yours down as you're in the middle of rendering. You don't have to stop your rendering. It'll scale and go from there. And Brian, uh, regarding Swarm, um, they would need an additional render node to use the other CPUs in the network, right? 
That's correct. Uh, V-Ray for Revit ships with a single render node license, but uh, we do have other render node licenses available. Um, so if you wanted to add additional render node licenses, you could do that um, to use those. Um, that's not a problem. Right. So there's uh, bundles of five and ten additional over the one that ships out with uh, V-Ray for Revit. That's correct. I have some great doing with that as well, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, great. So aerial perspective, uh, that's, that's kind of your, your fog, if you will. Um, and here's an example of that. Uh, let me go full screen with this so you can actually see. Um, uh, airport kind of demonstrator model that we've put up uh, here. And you can see aerial perspective gives the illusion of fog or, or high humidity or even low humidity, depending on how you've got it set up. Uh, and this, this is an example of a section box for model and white on a very large Revit model. And you can see that, um, that this particular model has, I believe, eight individual linked files. So it's a central model with eight individual linked files in it, uh, including furniture. And we've cut a section through that and rendered it out as a model in white. And you can see that we support that across the spectrum. Uh, interiors, again, um, no post here. We're, we're rendering. We've set up really good textures for the floor, uh, for the ceiling walls. We're using HDR to light here. And we're actually, from the frame buffer, using a little bit of um, bloom uh, in the scene. And that's how you can get to this level of imagery very quickly and very, very easily. So unfortunately, I'm a bit out of time here, but I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions, and, and I'm happy to answer your questions as they come across the wire. Uh, we got one question here. Are there online tutorials available? Any printed documentation available, PDFs, eBooks, um, or physical books? Um, I think, Brian, you mentioned earlier on the Chaos Docs, there is available resources for B-Ray for Revit. Um, but would you say from your experience it would help to understand some of the programming language for V-Ray? Uh, maybe to some degree. I mean, what we've done is we've got some quick start videos up on YouTube now, uh, and you can access those through the doc site. Um, we try to explain what some of the language is, but it's best if you have um, questions in regards to any of this stuff or it doesn't quite make sense. Mm -hmm. um, to certainly, you know, reach out to SolidCAD and say, hey, um, can you help us out a bit here? And I'm, I'm sure they, they, they've they got the ability to, to get you what you need to know there. Yeah. We've really simplified the doc on the Revit side of things. Mm -hmm. um, so it should be relatively easy to get up and, and running with them. We don't have anything in print quite yet. Uh, what we have available is, is all online, though. Yeah, and from my experience, getting started with V-Ray for Revit was relatively simple using the tutorial and just going uh, through the back uh, settings and just understanding um, what's happening. But uh, getting my first rendering did not take very long. I was up and going within probably a half an hour. Hmm. Any other questions? Uh, are false color and pseudo color camera settings available to evaluate intensity of light on surfaces? Not quite yet. This is a great, this is a fantastic um, question, actually. Uh, not quite yet. We've got some things that we need to do in the background um, in order to make that possible. Um, uh, most of the work that we have to do, um, frankly, is in regards to to lights and the way we process lights and getting those, making sure that the physical settings are in fact physical. Um, so not yet, but we are working on it and it is uh, absolutely on our roadmap so that you could pull, for instance, if you want to know what the lux is at any given point, um, you should be able to pull the lux and, and understand uh, from a lighting perspective how that's working out. Yeah, great. Uh, what was the discount code again? Uh, I'm going to show that in a moment. It's V-Ray Revit 10, and uh, I'll show the link to our e-store momentarily if you want to get started with it right away. Great. Um, any other questions? We're just going a little bit over our time limit. Um, I'm going to take over uh, and just close it off. If you guys have any questions, you're welcome to email us, and we will um, be sure to get back to you. 
So again, if you have any questions or you need uh, to purchase it right away, head over to the eStore.SolidCAD.ca and under the um, V-Ray Chaos Group uh, catalog there, you'll see an option to choose a V-Ray for Revit 30-day trial request. It's a $0 purchase if you want to do a 30-day trial for your company. Um, or if you want to purchase it right away, we do have a discount special V-Ray Revit 10 on the checkout. Just put that in as under the coupon code and uh, you'll get 10% off the uh, license. Uh, the one thing you should know about licensing, um, they are all floating licenses, okay? And one license does ship out with one render node, so you can use Swarm with a secondary CPU. Um, as of, I believe, today, Brian, you guys just shipped out uh, a new version of Free Ray for Revit, a new um, release build, 3.4 point something something. Oh, too. That is correct. Actually, just this morning we shipped out a kind of service release one for V-Ray for Revit. Perfect. Um, we've made some licensing improvements and, and a handful of tweaks and bug fixes. Great. So if you guys have already downloaded our uh, trial version or are using a trial, um, just make sure to run the uh, download the latest build uh, to update your uh, release build. And uh, if you have any questions, again, you can email us. Um, my, I didn't put my email address, but it is dcoogan at solidcab.ca, or you can reach me at uh, my extension 230, which is our 1877 number. Um, you're also welcome to speak to any of our other account managers that you deal with as well. Again, thank you very much. Um, next week, same time, we're going to be looking at part two, what's new in V-Ray for SketchUp, Rhino, and 3ds Max um, 3.4 release, which hasn't come out quite yet, right? Um, and we, you guys will be showing off some of the new features of that. In our third part, we'll be looking at uh, distributed rendering and swarm uh, best practices. Okay, thank you again. We'll be emailing all the information that we just presented. This uh, webinar has been recorded, so we will post it in the next few days on our YouTube channel. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great day, guys. Thank you again, Brian. Thank you.